okay. Um, and so on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to try and bring what I'm saying about this mysterious dimension of everyday life into, uh, how can I put it, into a kind of relation uh, with politics. Um, and I think that what I'm going to say uh, is almost from everyone in the political spectrum's terms. Uh, um, well, at least it has the virtue of being unusual. Um, I think it's a good thing to discuss politics at the AA. not itself a renowned political centre. And where I heard today a student who used to be here saying, now that I'm unemployed, of course I have to spend a lot of time shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is pretty much the quote of the century. <laughs> Since I'm unemployed, go tell that to the rest of them. Uh, since I went in I have to spend a lot of time shopping. In a way, though, I'm going to use uh, a so-called revolutionary slogan, uh, in effect, to show that it, it's doing the same thing. A few of you here are old enough to have seen in Paris in 68, what became a peculiarly popular slogan um, under the pavement, the beach. Uh, the literature is quite complicated on where this came from, uh, but it seems that it was from within the ambit of the situationists. Um, I shall be treating in the first while uh, the, the slogan to a kind of analysis which precisely shows or tries to show that it's using uh, an extraordinarily kind of orthodox uh, topography of what politics is and even a kind of um, Rousseau-esque slightly anarchical sentimentality and then I want to go on to propose an alternative way of thinking the relation Let's put it in terms of relation, <clears throat> the relation which has traditionally been posed as the relationship between art and politics. But with us, it's not art. It's these issues which we've been discussing uh, about the everyday the possibility of finding within the so-called everyday something which we still haven't finished in attempting to kind of define and to uh, to delimit The slogan under the pavement, the beach, I think I would probably suggest uh, the substitution of what I think is the far more analytic observation, which is 
under the pavement of the drains. Um, but in the way in which kind of desires work, the strangest thing is like children in the, in the, in the aspect of political wishes, people are always making wishes that come true and are even more appalling than where you were when you started with. I mean, wishes like, if only there were more communication, oh, please, no. <laughs> you know, and there are. Someone tells me you've got 500 emails unanswered. Uh, the, the beach, just in case you forget. Uh, and why being on the beach is like the acme of revolutionary fervor. <laughs> I think that we can, we can leave that to the French to uh, decide why they thought that was. I mean, it's, it's August. It's like, you know, under a revolutionary commune, it will always be August. <laughs> uh, the wish, actually, I know, because I was shown by a friend of mine who was marking finals. The, the, this same kind of political wish came out uh, in a finals exam in economics where the student wrote, under socialism, everyone will have an above average income. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, we're not, we're not too full of arithmeticians here. Uh, As always, you should beware of saying what you want because someone might supply it and then it's always catastrophic. It was actually the Commune of Paris that supplied the answer to the wish. I think it was in, the, it took a decade or something but since then, organized by the town hall, every August, Paris decks the quay by the Seine and covers it with sand and with umbrellas. So that now we have Paris Plage. Uh, and this must be taken as the fulfillment of the desire of the situationist demonstrator. Don't worry, you know, in surprising ways, capitalism will give you what you want to the point where you realize that was the very last thing you wanted. So, as it were, in this political group, so determined to have a counter-urbanism, so determined to take an anti-capitalist and revolutionary position on the city, it has its enduring monument, Paris Plage. Uh, of course, to say that is kind of deeply ungracious, unfair, etc. But one cannot fail to remark upon it. Oddly enough, I've seen no remark from the French on this question. Uh, you would have thought someone, I don't know, someone like Debray, <laughs> would have driven along the side of Paris Plage and thought, that's funny. <laughs> so we got what we wanted. I'm going to use another example of what I'm going to take as the anti-political politics 
of the everyday, or you could say of art. For 200 years, there has been a discussion of how art and politics should go together, with the running obviously made by those who demand that art is political. We'll look later on at the different modes in which art is supposed to be political. But they always mean in some moment the subordination of art to politics. <laughs> it is at that very moment that art could alone have the hope of being political by refusing the superiority of the instance of politics. And I'll try and sketch that out in some detail later. But I want to use, in a sense, a quotation uh, from a play which I think states as it were, in a very blinding fashion, the relation which I'm attempting to uh, elaborate and to put forward. Some of you may know the play by Georg Buchner, the German playwright at the beginning of the 19th century, who died in his 20s, leaving most famously the two plays, Wojtzeck and Danton's Death. Wojtzeck, which was later turned into an opera uh, by uh, Berg, to be performed later this summer in London. It's very unusually, very unusual for it to have a performance. And Danton's death concerning the persona in the French Revolution, who was the, in many sense, the leading revolutionary, certainly in the years uh, 92 and 93, and who, in a sense, uh, assumed the man mantle of prosecutor of the king, King Louis XVI, uh, in his trial and subsequent execution. It's clear from all the biographical testimony that Danton was by turns a great speaker, in many ways to his friends, a noble revolutionary. I say and also, but people would normally say but also, a sensualist uh, who had a passion for pleasure, who treated his friends uh, with great generosity <coughs> and inspired particularly the love of his last lover who is figures in the play. In the play the political situation has moved so that political power is veering towards the hands of Robespierre thought to be this cold, calculating lawyer from Ara. And who is using his authority over the Parisian uh, revolutionary groups to drive on the terror 
partly at the hands of Marat and Saint-Just. The friends uh, of Danton are continuously begging him to take his position seriously and that otherwise the machinations of Robespierre will ensnare him. It's suggested that Danton is too lazy to take effective organizational uh, action in respect to this and that he is far too haughty to acknowledge that this miserable little lawyer uh, could be the cause of his own downfall. As we know, in the mode almost of a coup, uh, Robespierre denounces him in the convention. He is arrested and the following morning is put to death. Now, in the play, because I think there's no other source for it, his lover follows him on the tumbril towards the guillotine when the mob are baying for Danton's execution. And he is placed on the guillotine. The blade falls and she catches the head. I mean, she, t she removes it from the basket. The mob are kind of braying at her. And she holds the head up of Danton and in a profound gesture shouts out Vive le roi! Long live the king! It is an extraordinary moment. Right? How are we to interpret her triumphant declaration, vive le roi. By any token, by any conventional political token, this is, shall we say, a very foolish thing to say. I mean, first of all, it's it's a highly imprudent thing to say. We must imagine that, of course, she, she herself will be arrested and executed. And what is she doing for the reputation of Danton? Is she not acknowledging, as it were, the false accusation that somehow Danton is not whom he seems, an accusation put forward by Robespierre. And if Danton were a revolutionary and a regicide, why would it be Danton, of all people, that you say, vive le roi? It's clearly, if we look at it another way around, kind of on the terrain of, you know, if this were a um, it would be something like a blasphemy. Right? In which Danton is being hailed, or as Althusser so would call, hailed and interpolated as the King of France. The very man who wished there to be no King of France. How can the man 
who wants there to be no king of France and be a king? Surely this is just a flat contradiction. But we have to push on and ask, what's a contradiction? I mean, what is a contradiction within this kind of discourse? What is it to call the man who wishes there to be no king of France and who cuts the head off the king of France? How could you call him the king of France? I think it's one of those moments, it's not that this is complicated, but it's one of those moments where thought really has to, in some sense, stop and take stock of itself and find some way of incorporating this gesture. I think if you just said, well, very silly woman, stupid that he took up with her, and even daft her of the playwright to g give her this imaginary and, you know, what a dreadful play. And perhaps we shouldn't show it anymore. I suspect around the room, there are many people who experience at this moment, if they're thinking about it, I mean, not if they're not. Uh, a kind of contradiction between thought which can't easily get beyond the formula I've said how can the man who calls for the death and kills the king of France be called the king of France that might seem clear as it were at some level the content of your consciousness. But I'll also lay a bed that you know, though we know not where, that you're having at least a conflict. You do see the point. She was right. He was the King of France. He was the object of which you would say, vive le roi. How could, you know, how can thought think its way through that? It seems to me obvious that there are two kings here. Uh, and before I start this exegesis, I want it to be clear, this has got nothing to do with the famous example of two kings uh, that we find in the political historian uh, Kantorowicz called The King's Two Bodies, which is a brilliant book, but I'm not talking about that. The two kings I'm talking about, one is a person in a political system representing a kind of jurisprudence which we would normally kind of refer to as sovereignty, right? A the power in the realm on the basis of French national and political reality. That's Louis XIV. He in turn is a representative of the French monarchy, an institution, you know, which is, has existed pretty much unbroken since the early Middle Ages. There's another king. There's a king who appears first and perhaps in a sense appears alone to children. 
that there once was a king and a queen who had one daughter, the princess. These figures are not figures in the monarchies of this world. They are the figures, we shall go on to say, of everyday life, where it is real to recognize that someone is the king, the queen, the prince, or the princess. Right. Not by birth, but because when we are children we do not have an elaborate language for the great, the good. We just say it's the king. I used to live next door to a small boy who drove his mother insane. He obviously, I mean, I think, he was bored to death with his life. <laughs> and when anyone rang the bell, his mother said, who's there? It's the king. I mean, he'd give out all sorts of important people that kept visiting his house. No, oh, prime minister was here while you were out shopping. I mean, she'd say, why did you say that? Because, you know, he was born of a wish to meet them. He met his of them, his them, not their them. We carry all the way through our lives. But we never notice the difference between my hymn and your hymn, or their hymn. The only word which you can use out of the depths of her childhood, and why else? Would she have been so over-loving to Danton? Why indeed would everyone have been over-loving to Danton, including his friends? Because of course, while they didn't say it, while they probably didn't even think it, he was the king. Indeed, even in politics, the reason why only he could kill the king was because he was the king. It's like there are questions of legitimacy, but they're upside down. We don't ask who's allowed to kill whom, but who is large enough to bear the name of what slaughtered. Answer, very few people, very rarely, uh, and it's usually the other way around. We don't take seriously contemporary politics, not whether someone should be murdered, often they should, assassinated, <laughs> absolutely. But who's going to do it? Who do you trust to kill someone else casually? <laughs> they bring too much intention to it. <laughs> In a sense, it's not difficult 
for you, I think, to grasp that. There are different kings in different worlds. And we have to know what world we're in. Now, if we're in the world of what's called politics, there's no harm in the damn thing. Well, there is. It's horrible. I think we should regard politics with contempt and distaste. But I have not the slightest sympathy with the view, well, if you feel that about it, why don't you get involved? <laughs> I mean, I can't stand people who play Monopoly. But, you know, I would be very confused if someone said, well, why don't you play it? If you've got such an objection to it. I mean, what, what good does play, my playing Monopoly do for anybody? Uh, now, by politics here, I don't mean so much the kind of machines of murder, because I think that's a slightly different world as well. Uh, I mean, things like, you know, stuff about taxes and everything that goes under the concept of sovereignty. The question that the left can never answer is why, why does that world suddenly trump all the other worlds when it comes to assessing their significance? answer, because that world determines the outcome of the future. Answer to that, no it doesn't. Hmm. I mean, I don't get a pension. But even if I had a pension, it wouldn't stop me dying. So I'm just going to be very poor, as opposed to fairly poor. <laughs> Tom P, I mean, you know, it's not worth going to the guillotine for. <laughs> um, and indeed, I'm not sure that nobody has noticed, but in some sense, politics at least in the fantasy which was uh, referenced between, shall we say, the end of the 18th century and possibly 1945, politics in some sense has, has gone. The fantasy of politics was that politics alone could be the general key to unlock all the other instances. Now, you might find it almost like a bit boring, but you know, it, it alone determines the role of all the others. It's not a Marxist proposition although it's a Leninist proposition. What I think replaced politics in some sense was what we might call administration. And what administration is about and the struggle we have with that instance the struggle we have with the inheritor is that what administration takes as its fundamental object is the production of normality. And what in some sense the object of what we're talking about 
of the everyday life is the disruption of normality. I mean, not because I'm here, you know, on behalf of some very particular campaigning abnormality. I just think a lot about pensions. How do, they, how do they get a pension to the Pope? I mean, what are they, was there a sort of Peter's pension pot that no one knew about? I mean, this is the first one ever who's getting get a pension. They talk as though all these ones retired in the 13th century. They didn't. They were murdered. Uh, and sort of stopped. But anyway, I mean, at least they were able to walk around, you know, the Vatican and say, at least we don't have to pay him a pension. Uh, and he's presumably going to be very constrained. I think he won't be able to confess to anybody because presumably the agreement at the end included a lot of non-disclosure clauses. <laughs> I mean, sorry, God, I can't tell you anything about, you know, CEOs have a lot of problem with, uh, with, co with confession these days. They probably have a lot of con problems with... There was one nice case, actually, of a psychoanalyst who was expelled uh, for being the beneficiary of what's called insider training. I mean, he had this <laughs> super boss banker in analysis who said, tomorrow the shares are going to, oh, are they? Oh, yeah. We're ending early today. <laughs> I think that's a very smart uh, <laughs> use of the, it's the transference and it's really literal, literal kind. Um, I'm asking you, inviting you, in a sense, to, to change the kind of topography of things. What used to be politics is really about relationship in some sense between sovereignty and territory. That's kind of how it came about to be the, you know, not just the linchpin for the king, but the linchpin for the peasant. Uh, and why everyone's dreams go through the negative thing, but before we get there, we've got to overthrow something. Let me put it this way. Before we get there, we don't any longer have to overthrow anything. But you do have to do it, whatever it is. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting, in a sense, then, a sort of analytic uh, disaggregation of what people used to call society. In which neither territory nor sovereignty capture a kind of superior instance. Now, in this sense it becomes a kind of plural society, not because everyone's a pluralist, and certainly not because now there aren't going to be wars, there are going to be far more of them. It's just they'll be called something else, like Neighbourhood Watch or something. <laughs> uh, the Buchner quotation makes it clear, in a sense, uh, that you cannot execute, as it were, the king from your childhood, except by becoming normal. In that sense, we use the everyday as a critique of it, the administered subject is actually part of the murderous mob.
Because in order for their behavior to become, and I use the most chilling word of the early 21st century, in order to become appropriate, I, I welcome discussion with anyone who's sort of chased up the origin of this unlovable word, uh, which seems to be reasonable and yet is more kind of murderous uh, than anything that ever has been spawned by anger. I found his behavior rather inappropriate. <laughs> Meaning not only he doesn't get the job, he's mad, should be incarcerated, whatever else. We can do anything we choose to make him appropriate. People who are appropriate have internally cut the head off, not of the political system, much worse, they've cut the head off a kind of, uh, the figure indicated and referred to in their childhood, the king the prince. Somewhere which was opened by our entry into that discourse, which of course is the temporality of the everyday in the sense, the particular sense we've been using it. The everyday's temporality is once upon a time. Once upon a time being, as it were, the past that in a non-traumatic sense repeats itself and repeats itself and is intertwined inexorably with the history. So it is, you often find, People who are thinkers, who are thought in a strange way, you know, to be at the very front of thinking. To think for a moment of, say, Jacques Derrida, Jacques Lacan. One of the curious things that would kind of, I think, unite that group is their solid linguistic commitment to, like, pre-modern virtues. Uh, as it were, it's a form of theorist for whom the term honor, hospitality, I mean, you know, they're always pre-modern. They're not, as they're denounced in the news, but some, in, you know, incomprehensible gobbledygook from, you know, some of the worst universities in world history. Uh, and the use of those pre-modern terms that someone might be thought to be noble or that we might feel grateful. I mean, when did you last hear the word gratitude used in the dimension of education? <laughs> I have a, excuse me. Uh, I said one out of ten, one or you know, one to ten. Uh, you're not going to get kind of government scores saying, you know, school in Essex was thought to be particularly graceful. Uh, lessons were given with a kind of harmonious and melodic satisfaction to everyone. Ofsted inspectors were weeping. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I 
And so Buchner presents this. I don't suppose thought about it nearly as long as we have. It's just instinctual. Um, But in raising his head and in saying vive le roi, she gives, as it were, a demonstration of nobility, <coughs> to use the second monarchical term, but where we cannot dispense with nobility. If all our internal words were drawn, just experiment for a moment, from legitimate forms of administration, if I told you that my feelings towards you were proactively uh, cooperative, <laughs> if I suggested to you that we should live together and write a mission statement, <laughs> <laughs> because as it were the normalization of things which includes uh, uh, the normalization of language here is producing, unless we rebel against it, we need the most piercing attention, not just to the language, to the, the very words with which we dignify others. Or, or render them banal. After which feudal manifesto, I, I end the day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have a half an hour uh, period, and I hope people will come back uh, for the artist talk, Clebo, and uh, I'll see you then. Thank you.